Welcome to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. This podcast is about all things outdoor photography, including landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more. The show features two talented photographers, Henry Doyle and Ryan Taylor, who bring their different experiences in photography to the podcast. The show is released weekly every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so I hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In today's episode, we go into the landscape with Sean Hoffer, a landscape travel photographer living full-time on the road. Sean breaks down step-by-step his shooting and editing workflow and his philosophies behind his adventures in nature and more. We hope you enjoy this insightful, inspiring conversation as much as we did. Welcome back to episode 52 of the All Outdoors Photography Podcast, and today we have a very special landscape photographer on the show. Yep, we have uh, Sean Hoffer on the show. Uh, Thank you, Sean, for coming on. Uh, Just go ahead and tell us more about yourself, your background, and uh, how you got into photography. Uh, Yeah, great. Um, First off, I want to say thank you guys for inviting me on. Um, I'm honestly honored to to be invited on to a podcast about photography, Um, and a little bit more about myself. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio area. Uh, I got into photography about six, seven years ago and started taking it more serious about, you know, maybe three to four years ago. Um, I'm pretty much self-taught or YouTube YouTube university taught. Um, And I, I mean, I shoot landscapes and I, you know, uh, do mostly like travel and landscape photography and I just uh, man, yeah that's basically it <laughs> awesome so what what kind of got you to pick up that camera in the first place there um you know I, <laughs> I wish it was like this great philosophical journey but I think like a lot of photographers out there we kind of you know start with the love of the outdoors and love of and I love to take you know photos of the hikes that I would go on and cool things I would see along the way and eventually I decided the the camera phone wasn't cutting it uh Mm -hmm. picked up I think my first um like digital camera was a Sony Next 5 or Next 7 um had a couple lenses for that I think it had like a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200 you know kit lenses basically for that and started taking more serious photos but not like artistic photos in any way more documenting my travels with a better camera essentially and then kind of progressed from there so basically just came out of a love for being outside and hiking yeah that's awesome what a great way to get started there yeah absolutely was it pretty jarring of an experience to like transition from doing use of a phone uh, to like a dslr um, absolutely. I think, you know, I think when I first <laughs> got my Sony Next 5, um, I had it on the intelligent auto setting and kind of like had still crappy photos that were basically like phone photos. Mm-hmm. Um, but then as I kind of, you know, got more and more into the taking of photos and, and whatnot, I, you know, discovered, you know, how to expose a photo and started to learn the manual settings and everything and and you know that's always a, a learning curve for any photographer awesome yeah for sure and it's kind of funny how it's come full circle too because now like modern smartphones have those like the pro mode features and you can adjust you know the exposure iso and so on it's pretty neat how it's all just come around it's kind of crazy how how far they've come it, you know i fear that i've spent all this money on my photography gear and i could have just kept upgrading my phone and and been a photographer that way. <laughs> true, true. I have those same fears. True. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, how many years ago was this when you really got into it? Um, I want to say like three or four years ago, I started taking it pretty serious. I started taking more serious trips geared towards just the photography mm-hmm. instead of just the love of travel. Um, and started like really diving deep into exposure triangle and editing and all that stuff <clears throat> yeah that's awesome yeah is there any reason maybe that you're drawn more to like landscape photography in particular um for me i think it's a love of natural landscapes um a love of the way the light plays on landscapes 
I've always found myself connected more to wide open vistas and woodlands and seascapes than, you know, any other type of photography. I've tried different types of photography. I've, you know, I think when you're first learning, you're excited to just go out and shoot anything with your camera. Um, so I've done portraits and I've done some wildlife stuff, but for some reason, I think the love of camping and the love of hiking has you more so out in the landscape and out in the nature, you know, of wherever you're at. And so I think that's why I connect more with that style of photography. Yeah. And I've, I've also noticed with that too, you kind of seem to uh, be more drawn to kind of the more magnificent and a uh, grand scale uh, kind of images. Is there a certain reason why you're drawn to that? Um, you know, that's a good question. So uh, I think the, the big reason for me is I love feeling insignificant in places. I think it's a very humbling experience to be in a place where you realize the scale and magnitude of nature and life and the universe as a whole. So things like grand landscapes where you have mountains and rivers and things like that all interconnected um, really just gives you a sense of your place in the world and how small you are compared to the world itself. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I've definitely thought that before with, you know, just walking through like an old growth woodland and you just feel, like you said, just feel very, very small in like the grand scheme of things. So I can definitely agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah. So do you normally shoot with like a, a wide angle lens for most of these shots? Um, most of them are shot with a 12 to 24 or 24 to 70. I do have a 70 to 200. Um, which I'm learning to use more and more. You know, I'm trying to use more and more, not learning, learning was the wrong word, but trying to use more and more because I am starting to love some more of those more intimate minimalist landscapes. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. And I feel like it does add diversity. Um, I know a couple episodes ago, we did one about portfolio development and it was, I, I was, I talked a little bit about, you know, using, different lenses and different kind of like styles. I mean, and there's the cool part about landscape photography is there's so many different styles and things you can do with it too. Absolutely. That's a hundred percent true. And that's, I think why, you know, I suggest, I tell every photographer to have, you know, several different types of lenses, whether, you know, they're wide angle or, or primes or, you know, telephoto or whatever, have a, have a, wide variety in your toolkit that way you can create a wide variety of images that you want to create yeah that's a great tip for sure uh do you carry all three of those lenses out with you every time or do you kind of just mix and match based on the situation um i think more recently it's kind of been based on the situation so i i travel full time for you know my day job um i was just living in washington for six months washington state and did some hikes in the Olympics, um, Olympic National Park, and some of them are massive, you know, uphill slogs going up several thousand feet, and to lug, you know, 50 pounds of gear sucks, for lack of a better phrase. Mm -hmm. So I would, I, I tended to, to just take my 24 to 70, because 24 is pretty wide, and 70s, you know, in that short range telephoto, and then using the crop sensor like function on my camera, the Super 35. Oh. I can crop in and it makes it like a hundred and something, 105 or whatever. So I get a pretty good range with just the 24 to 70 and using some of the functions on my camera. But most of the time I have all three, all three lenses. Interesting. And are you kind of anchored down to a tripod or are you more of a handheld person? Uh, always a tripod. I, I like the use of the tripod. One, I, I, I'm sure you've seen just from looking at some of the photos that I do a lot of longer exposures especially mm -hmm. when i'm shooting water um so always a tripod for me and i'd like using the tripod because it kind of slows me down and allows me to really take in what it is about the scene in front of me that i want to photograph i definitely agree with that there i do the same thing with doing the tripod and it, it does slow you down i think a lot you know and you could say that yep. it's like you know cumbersome in a slowing down sense but i also feel like it does 
meditatively kind of slow you down as well. If you really, you know, think about, take a step back and look at the composition or whatever you may be shooting. Yeah, absolutely. You're also more likely to wait for that good light too. If you can lock your composition in earlier and just kind of wait around. So, I mean, I can definitely see that in your work with like, um, like paths of light on mountains and, you know, all kinds of different formations. So I definitely see that there. Sure. Absolutely. I think one of the, you know, it's not like a trick or anything that I do. One of the things that I do with my tripod is like when I get to a location, I'll set up my composition and lock the tripod head, but then I'll take the camera off like while I'm waiting for the light and I'll just kind of go around handheld and, and maybe shoot some scenes handheld. And then once I'm getting the light that I want, I'll put my camera back on the tripod and it's locked into the composition that I want. I don't have to like hunt around for it or anything because I lock the tripod in the position that I want the camera to be in. That's a great idea. I've actually never heard of that before, but yeah, same here. I've heard of it. Huh. I'll, have to, I'll have to try that now. That, that's very, if you don't mind, that's a really interesting idea. No, I, I, I think it's just one of those things I've learned along the way. And I think, you know, I'm sure you guys have little tips and tricks for the, the ways you shoot that other people don't shoot, you know? So mm -hmm. that's one of the great things about photography is you can talk to a hundred different photographers and they'll all have different ways of doing the exact same thing. Yeah, it's crazy because, I mean, obviously you still, you're learning kind of the base knowledge from like the internet or books or a teacher, but we all kind of just develop our own styles. It's it's very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You venture far away from like that tripod, like do you find yourself wandering off going like, you know, maybe there's something cool over here and then you come back to it or are you just more like focused in the same area you may be shooting at? Um, you know, funny you, you asked that because I was, I was just in Moab um, a couple days ago and um, I was at this this very famous overlook called Dead Horse Point, Dead Horse Point in Dead Horse Point State Park. Um, very famous, you know, very famous photos are taken from there. Um, one of the most recognizable of the Southwest of America. And, uh, you know, I had, I had the tripod locked in the position I wanted, waiting for the light I wanted. And I took the camera off and I kind of went hunting for other things. And I was probably maybe a football field or two away from the tripod. I was the only one there. It was, you know, five in the morning, four, four in the morning or whatever, waiting for light. But yeah, I'll, I'll venture at, pretty far away sometimes. Um, and other times, if, if the area is like photo rich, obviously I'll stay a little bit closer, but there's so much to shoot around some of those locations because, you know, in, in the desert here in the Southwest, you have lots of like spangly trees and gnarled trees and stuff. And some of them make really good, you know, interesting photos. So sometimes we'll go hunt around for different compositions and, and different uh, things to shoot and then make mental notes of where they're at and maybe come back another time. Or maybe I think, you know, maybe I'll like the light later in the day on this, or I'll come back tomorrow for sunrise to this exact spot and shoot this subject. Um, so it just kind of depends on the situation. Yeah, for sure. It's like you're almost using the handheld mode, if I'm getting this right, to like make the secondary shots, but then you're still kind of like going after that the main focus, which is that tripod shot, uh, so to speak. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a really cool method for sure. So uh, it seems like you're very well traveled, and you mentioned your uh, your full time job. So it's, tell us a bit about that. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm a travel nurse. So I'm a I'm a registered nurse, and I work. I do contract work, you know, for, uh, through a company for basically any hospital I want to work at, um, that will offer me a contract. Um, and I travel, you know, throughout the United States doing that. So like I said, I was just in Washington state for six months working at a hospital on the Olympic peninsula. Um, and now we're, we're in Phoenix, Arizona, working at a hospital for the next three months. Um, so, uh, that's, that's basically my day job. I work three days a week, um, three 12 shifts, three 12 hour shifts. Uh, and then I have the four days off to go, you know, shoot if I want to shoot or edit if I want to edit or lounge around if I don't feel like doing any of it. So <laughs> that, that job that almost seems awesome. like it's, yeah, it seems like it's perfectly formatted for photography. Honestly, <laughs> it, it is. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. 
Okay. It is. Like, honestly, it's, it's allowed me to do so much and, and travel so much, you know, over the last, you know, you know, six months or so, because obviously with COVID, things have been shut down. And, you know, prior to COVID happening, I had some major trips planned to locations that I've dreamt of shooting for years. And then obviously COVID happened and everything got canceled, the world shut down. And my girlfriend and I got to thinking like, how can we still travel and still work, but not feel guilty about traveling? Um, and mm-hmm. we kind of settled on the idea of travel nursing. And so we started doing that and it's been, it's been a whirlwind. There's, you know, positives and negatives to living on the road full time. Um, but you know, for, for the things we like to do and how we like to live our lives, it's been pretty great. Yeah. That is, that is spectacular. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's quite the life right there. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about maybe like your setup. Are you living out on say about like an SUV or do you have like a full size RV or even one of those like sprinter vans that people use? I mean, I wish it was something more magical than that. So basically there's apps like Airbnb, uh, there's a thing called Furnish Finder. So we basically just rent, you know, uh, an apartment or a condo or a house for however long we need to. Like I said, in in Washington, we were there for six months. So we had two different places. We rented the first one for three months, the second one for three months. And here in Washington, we're, we're right now in a hotel because we're trying to figure out our Airbnb situation. There's been a little uh, snafu, we'll say, with that. Um, and, uh, so we're, we're still trying to figure that situation out, but we, we've been thinking about getting a tow behind trailer to, to kind of live in that basically and, mm-hmm. and kind of go from there. Yeah, that'd be cool for sure. Um, are you kind of based in around the state of Washington or is it all around the country or more regional? All around the country. So I, like I said, oh. I'm from the Cleveland area, um, which is where I used to work and, and live full time. Um, and now like I basically, you know, live on the road. So we go wherever the contracts, wherever we want to take a contract. So we decided, you know, we wanted to go see the Pacific Northwest for a little bit. We ended up liking the hospital we were at. So we stayed there for six months. Um, and then we were like, okay, we need to change. Uh, let's go to the desert for the winter. Cause that'd be cool. Right. Nice weather, mm-hmm. beautiful sunset for the next three months, you know? So that's why we just settled on the Southwest. Wow. You have any awesome. idea where you're, like, where you're going next after this? Um, we have like a, a short list of, of places we want to travel to. Um, and we'll, you know, try and knock those off as we go, but it just kind of depends on the, the need for nurses in each mm-hmm. state, essentially. Cool. That's awesome though. You get the freedom though with your, your day job to, you know, just go wherever you may please. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, do you have any like favorite locations you've been to so far during your travels? Um, my my absolute favorite place I've I've been to is Scotland. I've been to Scotland, you know, three or four times now, and it's it's just a magical place. I don't know how else to put it. Like, there's mountains, there's ocean, there's it's green, it's brown, it's it's just such a beautiful place. I wish everybody could go and experience it. And the people are so, so friendly. The culture is so, so amazing. Uh, so that's probably probably my favorite. Um, they're in Iceland. Uh, I've been to England. I've been to Ireland. Um, and they're all amazing. But for some reason, Scotland just has a piece of my heart for some reason. I, I can't explain why. It's just a place that like I feel so comfortable and connected to for some reason yeah that's awesome um, <laughs> makes you want to get out you know outside of my because I, I i'm from ohio and like i don't really i haven't really left the state that much in general so like yeah it's just neat to hearing that you identify with this other country um i'm guessing you're not from originally so yeah that's just awesome. no no i'm you know born and raised in in the cleveland area of ohio so i understand but you know, there's something to be said about staying local and shooting in your local area. I actually mm-hmm. admire you for that because you get to know the area so well. You get to see things in different ways um, than someone who travels all the time. So I, I think it's there, there's 
there's a difference to both ways of, of being, essentially. Um, and I think that's ultimately the goal is to find a location that I want to be in and want to settle in uh, and really, really shoot the, the, the hell out of that place, essentially, you know, and, and just mm -hmm. kind of make that my niche location. Yeah, and you don't have to feel as pressured with like one composition because, you know, you can come back many times and, you know, all those other benefits as well. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, you yeah. did say you're originally from the Cleveland area there. Um, I know there's like some cool places like uh, Cuyahoga, Lake Erie. Um, did you do any of that before you became a travel nurse? Or? Oh, absolutely. Um, some, you know, some of my favorite photos are taken along Lake Erie. Um, there's a lot of waterfalls in Northeast Ohio. Uh, so that, that's great. That's kind of how I got my start in photography was like, I think, you know, there's like a, a certain path that everybody kind of takes. They start shooting and they're like, Oh, these, these settings are cool. I can get motion blur. Let me, let me try and create smooth water. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's kind of how I got my love of long exposure photography was because there were so many waterfalls around me and there's the lake right there. So uh, Lake, Lake Erie and, and the Cleveland area, Northeast Ohio, definitely have a lot of photographic opportunities. Um, but I think, you know, I have such a wanderlust in my soul that e eventually it's like, okay, I've shot this stuff before. How many different ways can I shoot this area before I start getting a little tired of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's neat how that always comes in perspective because, yeah, I'm starting to get, I wouldn't say tired, but like I definitely – I'm familiar with a lot of my local parks, but like I haven't been up to Lake Erie yet. Um, I'm planning on it hopefully in the next year. And I know like the first time I'm going to go up there, I'll just be like jaw drop that, you know, sunrises or sunsets. So yeah, it's neat how that's like kind of plays in the perspective. Absolutely. And the storms that roll across Lake Erie. So if you're into, you know, moody, dark, stormy photography, beautiful location to be because you get the storms that kind of, you know, accumulate up there and roll in off the lake. So it's a great area. That's awesome. Yeah, keep that in mind. Um, you and then you, you guys are – sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and you guys are both, you know, into the wildlife scene. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, wetlands are abundant up there because of the oh, lake yeah. and everything. So, I mean, Ryan, you, you would love it up there. Uh, Henry, I don't know if you'd ever – you know, if you get the chance to, but, like, lots of, lots of bird life up there for you guys to shoot. Yeah, I was, I was at – lake erie um for about an hour that was about it um but it it was beautiful from what i saw i saw yeah some great wildlife and you know i took a couple landscapes it was it was beautiful so i know i noticed you talking about storms and kind of moody photography so would you say that's your favorite weather condition or you have other weather conditions that you really like um definitely moody i for some reason i identify with the moody aspects of nature i think for me, it has to do with like my philosophy of what life is and how nature is. Um, so definitely stormy, dark, moody, cloudy weather. And I also love sunrises way more than sunsets. I don't necessarily like getting up for sunrises, <laughs> but um, I like sunrises because there's a lot less people to be bothered by. So yeah, definitely, definitely sunrises and stormy moody weather for sure uh and when you go out yes. do you specifically look for those weather conditions or do you just kind of go out and see what happens uh, a mixture of both i'd say i definitely do a bit more of the kind of planning for the the stormy weather or the sunrises um and then just kind of doing it off the cuff um mm -hmm. even when i you know plan it out i try to find the locations or, or see where as I'm driving, checking the apps and, and the weather radar and everything, just seeing where, you know, the most uh, high possibility of having what I want to shoot is going to be. So definitely a mixture. Cool, yeah. Is there any kind of apps you would recommend? Like, um, you ever use, like, photo pills? I'm not sure if you use that. Uh, photo pills, definitely, you know, if you're into, like, definitely for sunrise, because um, one thing I've been trying to get better at recently is shooting in, high dynamic range scenes. Uh, so definitely using photo pills to help plan that out. Uh, that way I'm, you know, more directly facing towards the sun. 
Um, and then, you know, for a bit there, I was kind of into the astro thing. So using photo pills to kind of plan out where the Milky Way would be or where the North Star would be or whatever. Um, so photo pills definitely helps. It gives you an idea, you know, of where, where the light's going to come from, what direction you might want to shoot from if you want side light, back light, front lit, whatever. Um, but as far as weather, I use the, I use just, I think uh, it's AccuWeather on my phone to just kind of get a general idea. And then I'll mm -hmm. use the, the Windy app um, to kind of plan out where those storms really are or where the, the wind is coming from and where the clouds are at. It's great that you put that much planning into it. Wow. And that, I, I try mean, it, definitely, <laughs> it definitely shows off in your photos for sure. You've got those obviously making use of that long exposure to blur those clouds and, you know, combining some of those early morning colors too. Creates yeah. a really great combination there. Thank you. Boom. So I noticed on your website, um, you mentioned um, that you chase a feeling with your photographs and is there any particular feelings that maybe you hope like prospective viewers may see in your work? Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned that, that feeling of being, small and insignificant. I think that's why a lot of those places that I have on my portfolio are shot in wide angle ways or from a wide angle, you know, point of view um, and kind of have this very grand and big feeling or, you know, the mountains seem, I try and get this feeling with my mountain shots that they're looming over you and they're bigger than you. So definitely that kind of feeling, that, that sense of wonder at the natural landscapes around you. Um, and then just, I, I hope to, you know, invoke or, or put upon my viewers, whoever they may be, however many there may be, uh, just a, uh, an interest in the natural landscape and, and what's out there to be seen. Because I think travel is just one of those things that everybody should experience and getting out and into nature is one of those things that everybody should experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I noticed in your imagery, it's like, at least for me, it really pulls me in. Like, it's almost like escapism in like a good way, of course. Like, it pulls me in. And it makes me just feel like the time and place, maybe you were there. And it, um, it just really is transported. I don't know. I really like what you do, man. It, it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That, that honestly means a lot. I've been, I've been thinking a lot more about, you know, everybody – harps on and talks about uh, style in photography, whether it's your style of portraiture, your style of wildlife, your style of landscape photography. Um, and I think we all go through this thing of trying to define our style or figure out, do I have a style? What is my style? And I think lately I've been getting away from the thinking about style and thinking more about philosophy and feeling uh, and, and that kind of leading to what your style is. Cause I think everybody's style kind of goes through a period of growth, right? Like you start mm -hmm. as an amateur, you know, you're not editing your photos as much. It's more documentarian, at least it was for me. Um, and then, you know, your style kind of shifts to a, a little more artistic, a little more editing and then you're doing a bit more in Photoshop and doing a bit more with this or, or a bit more with that. And eventually, like, you have a style. But I, I think for me, it's been more about the philosophy of why I shoot and what I want to shoot and what I want to portray is more so defining my style. Yeah, that's true. And it, it's gotten more saturated, you know, as photography has become more accessible with just the technology and everything. And um, I feel like, I don't know, it, it's harder to really nail down your style when you feel like everyone else is shooting the same things or something similar. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, how, how long do you think it took you to really, like, let's say, and it's always evolving, of course, but, like, to really feel like, okay, this is the Sean photography that, like, I like to make. Like, how many years or, like, what was the timeline for that? Um, I don't think there's necessarily a timeline. It's actually a really good question. Um I think, you know, it's an evolution. So, you know, you start at, at the, the very new end and as you kind of learn more and learn what you like to photograph, things will change. And I think as long as you keep learning, uh, which I feel like 
there's always something new to learn with photography, you know, Mm -hmm. things will always be changing. And I, and I hope to always be that way. I mean, I have a workflow that I like to kind of stick to, but as I've learned new techniques, I keep adding things into that workflow and, and they're helping me create the images that I want to create. So I think it's more, more of a slow evolution than just a kind of cookie cutter, you know, I started here, I wanted to end here. You know, I don't think I ever want to stop developing my workflow or, or my style or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's when it would get boring. Yeah, once you feel right, like you've exactly. kind of like made it. Yeah, yeah, so I definitely agree there. You want to talk a bit about that workflow, kind of the, the steps in that? Um. Yeah, sure. So I think, it, you know, it comes down to, you know, figuring out wherever I'm at, you know, it, whether I'm in Cleveland or... Uh, in Washington or Arizona, or if I'm in Scotland on a trip or whatever, um, figuring out, you know, where I want to shoot. So I kind of pre-plan, look at maps, uh, get on Google Earth, look at, you know, different areas in the region that I'm at, um, looking at photographs that, like, Google Earth has from that location, getting ideas of possibilities, um, to actually picking a location or a set of locations that way I can maybe be a bit more flexible because I I don't like to limit myself to one location that way I can react a bit better to the light that is happening or the weather that is happening um but even if I pick like let's say you know I'm I'm gonna go shoot this mountain peak today fine I'll, I'll pick that location but I'm still going to try and have you know a different a couple different scenarios in my head of how I want to shoot depending on, on the light. Um, and then it comes to the shooting of it, you know, the, the, the taking of the photographs. Um, I don't ever really set a limit or say, okay, I wanna shoot this many wide angle or this many telephoto. I'm only gonna shoot telephoto. I'm only gonna shoot wide angle. I don't do that. I kind of let the feeling I have in the area and let the light that I have in the area kind of depict how I want to shoot. So if Mm -hmm. I have, for example, like if, if the clouds are high and, you know, there's some dappled light on, on the valley or, or the mountainside, um, I'll probably be shooting a bit more wide angle. Whereas if I have, you know, low hanging clouds and the mountain peaks are kind of coming in and out, I'll probably shoot a bit more telephoto because, I like the drama of those clouds moving through and revealing those peaks. Um, So I I like to kind of react in that way and not limit myself to saying, I'm only going to shoot this or I'm only going to shoot this for this long. Um, And then, you know, I kind of shoot the location until I feel like I've gotten the things I want, or if I'm not getting the things I I want, then I'll move. Um, But let's say, you know, I, get what I want. I'm, I go home and usually it takes me a couple of days to get the, the photos off of my camera. I kind of let myself decompress a little bit from a recent outing. That way, when I upload those photos onto the computer, I can look back and say, oh, this is so cool. I remember seeing this. And it gives me a more clear sense of what I want to do. Because I think when you're, I think we all, when we take a photo, we're like, oh, if I do this and dodge and burn this area, I can bring that out a bit more. And I I think I do that, but I don't want to be limited by that idea of I'm going to edit it this way. So I like to just Mm -hmm. kind of sit back on the images and take my time, take a few days off from, from looking at them. Then after a few days, I'll upload them and start editing them. Uh, and that's kind of my workflow from field to editing, essentially. Yeah, I think that's a great strategy, uh, kind of letting your photos sit there and just kind of, because I feel like when you when you can get back from a, a shoot, you can try to rush into things too. Um, and, you know, like just kind of do these edits that you'll end up regretting later on anyway. So I think it's great the way you do that. Um, it takes Absolutely. a lot of uh, patience too, I think. Uh, and I, I commend you for that. So. Yeah, it, it's definitely 
yeah, it's definitely hard, you know, because if it's been like an epic sunset or an epic sunrise or something, whatever, like I definitely do have that wantonness mm-hmm. to go back and edit right away. Um, but I, I try and hold off and, and try and, you know, give myself a little little bit of time to decompress and just kind of sit back and think about what did I witness and what did I feel? And then I'll try and take that into, you know, viewing of those images and editing of those images. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, your whole process is very thorough and laid out, which, you know, I can respect. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Is there any, like, sort of, like, gear that you may use or post-processing software that you may, like, recommend? Um, I, you know, I, I wish I had something extravagant. I use Lightroom and Photoshop, you know, just, just like mm-hmm. most photographers, I think. So, Brian, I think you use Luminar, right? Yeah, uh, Luminar and uh, Aurora, which are both from Sky. Okay. All right, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just use uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, and and that's basically it. And do you do a lot of heavy Photoshop work with like dodging and burning and all that, or are you mostly just Lightroom with a little bit of cleanup in Photoshop? Um, so I'll do some of my more basic adjustments, my more global type of adjustments in Lightroom, and then I'll transfer those files over to Photoshop, and that's where I'll do my exposure blending, my focus stacking, um, and my dodging and burning and, and adding of uh, uh, Gaussian blur um, if I if I want to on a photo, if I think the photo warrants it or not. Interesting. So you mentioned like uh, focus stacking. Uh, is that pretty much all of your wide angle images or is it uh, just a few amount or what, what is your process there? Um, most of my images are focus stacks, even if there's not something uh, directly in the foreground. Um, I have a couple images from, from like Scotland where I was taking uh, pictures of the, the Kerrang, which is a, a very famous location to take photos, one of the most famous spots in the world to take photos. And even if things are in the distance and I'm shooting, you know, wide at 12 to 16 millimeters, I tend to take a couple different uh, images for focus. That way I know things are going to be in focus. Um, I just started wearing glasses this past year. So, uh, it's been a, it's been a learning curve with the glasses. And I think that's why I tend to take a bit more, you know, images to make sure focus is nailed. Yeah, actually I relate to that perfectly. I, I started wearing glasses about a year ago as well. And I definitely notice the difference in my viewfinder and stuff and just kind of being yeah i just i just actually lost my glasses in in a river in cleveland so that was that was cool (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's hard to trust manual focus too when you're like i don't know if i you know got that quite right so right exactly so like i haven't i haven't worn my my glasses or contacts for the last couple months because or the last few weeks because i lost my glasses like i said so I've just been making sure that everything's in focus just to be safe. And I, and I like, I like uh, the, the sharpness from front to back for my images. There's something to be said about uh, bokeh in landscape photography. I, I do like when it's used sometimes. Um, and then there are times where, where I'm just like, I, I think that could benefit from being sharp from, from front to back, but that's just my personal taste, you know? Do you ever mess around with, like, the Orton effect? You know what that is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I, like I just mentioned, I, I'll use the, the Gaussian blur or, or, or the Orton effect in my uh, photos. And that's something I started more recently uh, because I've been pushing to be a bit more artistic in my photos and, and push my photos uh, a bit further to, to create that look that I like and that, that inspires me. So, yeah, I, I do do that, definitely. And then ex- yeah, exposure that's... blending as well. Is that a frequent use for you or is that just in the most extreme cases? Um, usually in the most extreme cases, but it's becoming more and more of a, of a thing for me. I've, I've just been playing around a lot recently with learning how to really shoot and get proper exposures for high dynamic range scenes because I think that's one of my weaknesses as a photographer is shooting into the sun. 
um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a sunrise or a sunset um, and shooting, even if it's like, you know, a more diffuse scene, but you have bright reflections uh, just to make sure I capture all the uh, image data that I want to create the image that I want. So it's, it's definitely been more of a thing recently. Um, I've been learning luminosity masking um, from Greg Benz. I, I downloaded his whole thing on how to use uh, lumin how to do luminosity masking and Nick Page as well. I've been watching his tutorials on YouTube. That way I can kind of nail it down. And it's, that's a, that's a learning process. That's probably within one of the harder things for me to learn. I'd say it's one of the trickiest like conditions to shoot in too, because you have to like meter so precisely and it's, it's just tough yeah. and you get sun flare and everything else. So yeah, there's all these variables you know, just being thrown at you. Yeah, absolutely. I just did a, a shoot that I'm kind of mad at myself for doing, but I was in the area and I thought this is going to be a pretty good sunrise. It'd be remiss of me not to go shoot this location. Uh, another pretty popular spot called Mesa Arch. Um, oh. And yeah, I know. <laughs> I feel bad for going to shoot it because I've been to Moab like half a dozen times and have refused to shoot it mm -hmm. every single time. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's November. So I was like, you know what? The crowds are going to be a lot less. So maybe I'll go. Got there very early and I was, my girlfriend and I were the only ones there, you know, for a wow. long time. And then just as the sun was about to rise, like 30 people showed up. Um, but I had my spot picked out, so I was pretty happy about it. And, you know, the sun rose directly up right where I thought it would, like right into the middle of, you know, the lens, essentially, the, the field of view. And for sure, lens flares, ghosting, all kinds of stuff. But I'm hoping I got all the all the data. I haven't processed those images yet. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Hope for the best, at least with that, yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Or, or I'll just scrap those and, and say I never went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bury your past. <laughs> exactly. Uh, do you find yourself like avoiding those more traditional or like I call them postcard shots or do you, do you like to do the more off the beat, off the beat path uh, images? Um, I think a mixture of both. So, you know, there's all this debate in photography nowadays. Should you shoot the postcard locations? Should you go to these well-known locations? Um, and I think everybody kind of likes to do them and starts out doing them because, especially like when I first started learning, you know, how to do uh, photography properly, I would go to the locations. That way I could, you know, recreate images that I've seen. That way it would help me learn. I'd say, okay, this is kind of how they shot this. This is how I would expose this. It helps me learn photography, shooting some of these more well-known locations. Um, but as I've kind of grown as a photographer, I definitely uh, like to get out and, and kind of find my own things or shoot the, the popular locations in my own kind of way. I have no problem if people want to go shoot the icons because it's like, yeah, someone else has shot it, but I don't have that shot. So mm -hmm. go shoot it. But then also go be prepared to find your own stuff and tell your own story as well. 100% agreed. Yeah, that's, all, that's perfect. Yeah. Do you find yourself uh, printing a lot of these photos or uh, are you more um, of an all digital kind of person? So I do have a print shop on my website. Um, shameless plug here if anybody wants to go get some. Um, <laughs> um, no. So for me, I, I love the idea of printing. I think a lot of my photos are too dark to be printed. Um, I've run into that problem a couple times, you know, where that's happened. Um, so I, I think that's definitely a thing I want to learn more about, um, printing and editing for print. Um, so more from more of that in the future, definitely. How's that experience been overall, like seeing your work in like a tangible form? Oh, I love it. I think everybody should get their photos printed. Um, I, I think it's such, it connects you to the images in, in such a different way than seeing something on a screen does, you know? 
yeah, yeah, for yeah sure. I definitely agree with that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's like printing your work just adds this whole dimension. It's like, I know for me, it's like when I started doing that, it just felt like the final like piece of the puzzle, I guess. You know, instead of shooting and editing in, indefinitely and on like a, in a loop, I guess, it's like, oh, the printing's really where it ends for me in a way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I want to shift gears here to uh, as we wrap up the show here. So I, I want to ask, um, a little dramatic, but where do you see yourself in your photography career? Um, you know, just in the future. That's a good question. Um, you know, I've been working a lot of, on a lot of things behind the scenes. I love sharing photography with people and talking about photography with people, and I love educating people on photography. So I think I see myself pushing into the educational aspect. I love to lead workshops um, and I'd love to do some editing tutorials and, and whatnot. I'm actually planning on getting into YouTube here in the future. I just bought some equipment and gear to uh, start up on that. Um, so definitely moving into the educational side of things and, and YouTube side of things. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think that's, that's really awesome. the future, honestly. This kind of yeah. YouTube and the social media space. Definitely. Yeah, producing your own content. I know Henry and I both, uh, we've made videos on our YouTube channels. So, I mean, I'd recommend it. Right. Definitely. Yeah, definitely and I love it. both your guys' videos. So, you guys do great stuff. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You yeah, too. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, so uh, is there any, like, uh, favorite inspiration, shout-outs, uh, anything else you'd like to add? Any, any other um, shameless plugs? Uh, I think, you know, inspiration is one of those things that's kind of weird because I think inspiration mostly comes from what I'm shooting. Um, but I think there are definitely photographers out there who inspire me and have helped me along the way. Um, the, the two biggest who have influenced me and helped me, um, my, my friend Kath Chimard is an amazing photographer. Um, I've gone on a couple workshops with her and she's been incredible She's so knowledgeable. She's so excited to teach and so excited to help people learn. Um, and then uh, another photographer named Dan Ballard, who is from Colorado. He's an incredible landscape photographer. Um, and he, you know, I've been on a couple workshops with him and he's helped me a ton as well. Um, and they both, you know, given me ideas on, you know, business side of things and pushing into the more professional side of things. And I can't, you know, uh, thank them both enough. That's awesome. Great. I, I haven't heard of either of the names, but yeah, I'll definitely have to check out the work some more. Yeah, uh, Kath is, uh, is is pretty amazing. Like she she's a very moody, blue tone images. A lot of composites of mountains with stars and and whatnot. And then Dan is you know very artistic, mountain scenery. Uh, very big into you know not shooting the icons and finding his own way and stuff. So very different styles and, and, and whatnot, but both super knowledgeable. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, it's been a great conversation, Sean. So uh, where can people go to learn more about your work? Um, probably, you know, Instagram. It's S Hoffer, S-H-O-F-F-E-R underscore photography on Instagram. And then my website, um, www.SeanHofferPhotography.com dot com awesome awesome it's been thanks a great conversation on, yeah of course thanks yeah. it was an awesome yeah. conversation great talking to you guys uh so thanks so much for having me on i really enjoyed it yeah and keep really up insightful. the great work yeah thank you and you guys you guys too thank you oh, thank you thank you so much for watching the all outdoors photography podcast you can find us on spotify apple podcasts google podcasts and the video version on youtube as well you can subscribe down below and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.